like to say good morning to all of you. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. We're thankful to be in the house of the Lord one more time and thankful to open up Black History Month. Amen. While we celebrate Black History Month, you don't have to be limited to February. Amen. Black people are making history every day. Amen. Today, our Sunday school lesson, speaking truth to power. Speaking truth to power. People don't like that. Uh, people discourage that, as a matter of fact. Um, but sometimes it is necessary to tell the truth to those who are in authority. Amen. Our key verse, Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Today, in our backdrop, David has had the husband of Bathsheba killed, Uriah. If I could tag a subtopic to this, I say justice for Uriah. Amen. Uh, David lusted after Uriah's wife. He was supposed to be at war. The Bible, the scripture explicitly says at the time when kings go to war, David was at home. And he found himself on the roof and he saw what he wasn't supposed to see. And amen. People want to blame Bathsheba for being up there, but David was not where he was supposed to be when he was supposed to be there. If the king was at war, he would have been on the battlefield. When it was not time for war, the soldiers wouldn't have a need to be on the battlefield, and Uriah would have been at home with his wife. Amen. Uh, David had taken Uriah, his wife, Bathsheba, to himself. He got her pregnant, and he tried to bring Uriah home and cover up his sin. And Uriah was so good of a faithful soldier to David that even when David got Uriah drunk, he still would not go home to his wife. He slept right there uh, at the king's palace. Basically wanted to make sure he took care of David's need before he took care of home because he knew he was supposed to be at war. So David got away with it for a while in the eyes of man. But God sees all. And that's where we come in our Sunday school lesson today. I want to give a couple of things from uh, the teacher book that I thought were very interesting. Um, first, why this lesson matters. Because people often see acts of injustice being committed. How are we called to respond when we witness unjust acts? That is the question. And here is the answer. Nathan sought God's guidance and received wisdom for how to address David's sin. Right. We got to seek God's guidance for how God addresses things. And amen. Thanks be to God. That's, that's, that's about what the sermon is going to be about today as we deal with our last gift. But we are to address those caught up in sin in a certain way. It says, whatever form it may take, the abuse of power is an infringement on others' right to justice. Whatever form it may take, whatever form the abuse of power takes, the abuse of power is an infringement on the other's right to justice. In other words, I can't get justice if the judge is corrupt. I can't get justice in a place where those who are in authority are corrupt. No matter what venue it may be, it may be the court system, it may be the police station, it may be the church, it may be your job, but when those who are in positions of authority are not right, those who are under them can't get right justice. Confronting abuse of leaders is usually risky and dangerous. Mm -hmm. yes, it is. If carried out violently, protests and civil unrest can have undesirable negative effects. Uh -huh. We need to remember that. God's word lays out steps for confronting 
and holding leaders accountable for how they use their power to govern or oversee God's people. The important thing to know is we cannot let injustice exist anywhere because it's black, the Black History Month. I, I'll repeat the words of Dr. Martin Luther King. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Can't let somebody go on and be unjust and, and, and carry out injustice and you don't confront it. And people in this society today will, will, will cast you out, will counsel you, will talk you down when you try to speak against the person they love, no matter how wrong that person is. Amen. When you are the executor of injustice, the people under you cannot receive right justice. says the abuse of authority by secular and religious leaders is a sin against God and a detriment to those they are to protect and serve. God is the author of government and civil authorities are supposed to be a source of fear only for those guilty of disobeying the laws of the land. That's in the word of God. Romans chapter 13, 1 through 3. We are to pray for those who have leadership, but then it tells why God gave the leadership. They are a threat to the guilty, yes, sir. not put in place to wield their, their own will on those that they don't like. That's right. That's right. The separation of church and state does not relieve any level of civil authority from accountability to God. You might get away with it in this land, but there's a judge greater than you, Amen. and you're going to have to face it. Says, ironically, this lesson was written during the time of civil unrest in our country due to the abuse of power by law enforcement officers and the sitting president uh, at the time. Justice is perverted and the rights of the minority citizens are being disregarded. God is aware and in his own time, he will confront and render his judgment on this sin. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we have the right and responsibility to confront power abusers within the boundaries of the law and the word of God. Amen. Reformation without spiritual transformation is not the solution. That's why the church was needed in the civil rights movement to properly guide those who would protest the way that God would have them to protest wrong. Today, the church has a silent voice and we've taken a back seat on the issues that plague our communities today. Yeah. And people don't respect the church because the church has taken this back seat. But we still need to be the front runners. We still need to be the ones to help to lead and guide those emotional people and right to be emotional on how to speak true to power. Yeah. 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 So in our word, and our first, we have two outlines. Amen. In the first outline, the Lord sent Nathan, the prophet, to David. And Nathan came to David in a way that was so God strategic that David had no choice but to respond rightly to what happened. Because oftentimes, well not oftentimes, really 9.9 .9 times out of 10, we can see the wrong in somebody else before we can see the wrong in ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're quick to jump on somebody else for being wrong uh -huh. before we look at ourselves in the mirror. Yeah, yeah. And even though we know intellectually that is not right, that's still how we are behaving. Uh -huh. So Nathan came to David with a strategy from God, and Nathan gave David a parable. Yeah. And, and, and it didn't sound like a parable uh -huh. because Nathan just straight up told David a story and when David got so mad, David thought the story was real. Uh -huh. He said there were two men in one city. Yeah. One of them was rich, one of them was poor. Yeah. The rich man had exceeding flocks and herds, uh -huh. but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, right. which he had bought and nourished up and it grew up together with him right. and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and right. drank of his own cup and right. lay in his bosom and was unto him a daughter. Right. Poor man, didn't have anything but a little baby lamb. And he treated that lamb 
like we treat our dogs and cats today. You treated it like another daughter. They even called them daughter and son today. So, so those of you who call your pets daughters and sons ought to understand how this poor man felt about his lamb. There came a traveler unto the rich man. And he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. For a visitor. Even though it was culturally right and according to law, when a stranger came or when a visitor came, you're hospitable to him. This man did not take from the many flocks that he had. He took the poor man's little baby lamb. Had him some veal chops. Uh, or lamb chops. But David got mad. He got mad because the rich man took the poor man's only lamb. Imagine a nerve and David still hadn't been confronted about having Bathsheba's husband killed. David said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man that have done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Let me tell you something. Even though David had a mind to execute justice for the poor man and his lamb, didn't matter if he gave that poor man four other lambs, he took that man's lamb that he treated like a dog. You can't replace something or someone you love that much. And the point of that is that you took Uriah from Bathsheba. You can marry Bathsheba all you want to, but you can't replace the man she married. Nathan said to David some chilling words. You are the man. You the man you mad at. But you can't see him in the mirror. You, you got to be like Michael Jackson. You got to look at the man in the mirror. Amen. You, you, don't be running around looking at what everybody else is doing. Getting mad because somebody else is doing when you the one that's stuck in the sin. You'll hear that again later on. David was mad and he was ready to execute justice and he really implicated his own self. He said, as the Lord lives. So in other words, he took an oath and he swore before God that he was going to find the man that took this you lamb and he's going to have him killed. And Nathan said, you are the man. But if Nathan just went to David and just confronted him and told him, you wrong for doing what you're doing, would have been a different reaction from David. He had to put David on a, on a level that David could understand the weight of what David had done. And it's so easy for us to understand the weight of what we do doing when we do what we do all the time by looking at what somebody else has done. And you're mad at somebody else, but you need to look at yourself. Nathan gave David the words of the Lord. He said that I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you out of the hands of Saul. Right. I gave you your master's house uh -huh. and I, your master's wives unto your bosom. Right. And I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. Uh -huh. And if that had been too little, I would have given you more. Uh -huh. I called David to remember what I gave you already, why you are here in this position, why you have this authority in the first place, but you have taken matters in your own hands instead of remembering me. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord and did evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword and hath taken his wife to be your wife and slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Uriah was one of the greatest soldiers that David had. He was listed in the Chronicles among David's mighty men who killed many people by himself because the Lord was with him. And David took one of his finest soldiers and just threw his life in a trash can because he wanted the woman that he was married to. You despise the Lord 
when you do search. A last outline. David gives a response. David has seen the error of his ways. David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath also put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. Look at the mercies of the Lord. Amen. But see, you got to read Psalm 51 to hear David's true response. Yes, yes. David says, against thee and thee only yes, have I sinned. Yes, yes. David admits his error. And he says that God has crushed his bones uh -huh. with his word. Mm -hmm. It crushed David to know that, that God found him out. Well, God didn't find him out. God already knew, but it crushed David to know that God addressed his sin and he brought his sin before him. It crushed David to understand the weight of his own sin and instead of rearing up and getting mad at God and getting mad at David, David repented. David said, create in me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit. David didn't respond like a prideful and arrogant, pompous person. Amen. David was humble. He was humble because he had relationship with the Lord. Even though David did what David did, God put this, this title on David as a man after God's own heart. We need to understand that people after God's own heart are going to make human error. But true people after God's own heart will be able to see their error and they will repent and turn from their wicked ways. That's it. That's right. What do you do with a person who is unrepentant? What do you do with those who are in power, who won't hear the word of the Lord, even though they claim to be Christian? What do you do? You take your case to the Lord. That's what you do. God will give you a strategy. God will give you an answer. And while it may seem that the wicked get away with their wickedness in this land, they still have to face the judge. David repented, but he still had to face the judge. Because after this, the child that David got Bathsheba pregnant with became sick and passed away. David could not get away from the judge. Even though David was shown mercy, judgment still had to be carried out. And I guarantee you in a land where justice and judgment is just as corrupted as it ever was, even though it may not be as blatant as it used to be, the judge is watching. And he will. Vengeance is mine. Yes, Saith the Lord. We're going to turn it over to the hands of our deacons.